The nation's searing wound is ripped open again and again. Is there a way to stop mass violence before it ever happens? And our cup overfloweth with lakes and rivers on the rise. Is this the new normal? And if it is, what does it mean? Today is Sunday, August 11th, 2019, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. I'm glad you're with us this morning. Seven and a half years ago, 20 children, all six or seven years old, 20 children were killed when a gunman opened fire at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. That was long after Columbine and long before what we saw last weekend in El Paso and Dayton. 26 people were killed in all at Sandy Hook, but 20 little kids. Most everyone came out of it saying we have to do something, but that something proved elusive. And so now here we are with El Paso and Dayton and Gilroy and Parkland and Pittsburgh and Las Vegas and too many others. And we're debating again, but to what end? Can we find a way to do something? I mean, maybe we can't do everything, but can we do something? Because maybe our disagreements over whether we can do everything keeps us from doing anything. We're going to talk this morning with the voices of law enforcement. Where can we find enough common ground through which we can carve a path out of this disgraceful and insane pattern that keeps repeating itself? And a little later on, the water has been on the rise to a dangerous degree. Flooding problems all over the place. Docks and piers swallowed up, causing danger along our shorelines and swells and currents that have taken almost three dozen lives in Lake Michigan alone this summer. If this is a new normal, what does the Great Lakes State need to do to manage our greatest natural resource? It's all today on Flashpoint. Well, the last week has been dominated by worries over these mass sprays of violence that hit El Paso and Dayton. But those were merely the most recent. For most of us, it can be a passing concern, but for some, it's their job to worry and strategize over imagining the worst. And I have three such people with me today. First, Wayne County Sheriff and the former police chief of the city of Detroit, Benny Napoleon, is here. For 27 years, he's been the Washtenaw County prosecutor, Brian Mackey, is with us, and the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Matthew Schneider, back with us again. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being here. I Brian, do. I'd like to start with you because you said something just before we started this conversation that is chilling and goes to the heart of the problem. You, you said, I, I fear we're losing our ability to be shocked. Once we get to that point, I don't know that we can muster the energy or the imagination to solve anything, can we? It's difficult. It's difficult. I think about early in my career, a school shooting at the University of Michigan campus. Two murdered. The murderer meant to get many more. He had a hit list. But that would not be news now beyond Michigan for a day. That was, was that was the, early 80s, right? It was eight, It was Good Friday, April 17th, 1981. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Any, what, what what do we do? Uh, we all throw up our hands. We we muster a lot of. I mean, it's painful. This is agonizing for so many Americans. And yet, finding a path forward. Uh, what would make you? What would help you sleep easier at night? As somebody oh, it would take a who, whole lot. And well, uh -huh, I, and, I'm and sure. I'm not real comfortable that that will happen because. You know, there are names that are just burned into our brains. Parkland, Columbine, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, Las Vegas, Pulse Nightclub. I mean, and we could go on and on and on. But my frustration and my agony and my real belief that this problem is something that is going to be extremely difficult to solve occurred when we didn't see any real action after Sandy Hook. Yeah. When you, that, when you right. think that someone could murder 20 babies and that does not get people at the table jointly talking about that and it's an, it's it's a discussion like the one that's going on right now because of what happened in Dayton and what happened in El Paso you're going to have discussion it's going to be a whole lot going on for a week or two and then it's going to be silence until something else happens but Matthew does it speak to the fact that we don't really seem to know what to do about it well, first of all, we have to acknowledge for all of us that this problem is not going away. And in fact, it's getting worse. As Brian was saying, in his history, that one incident happened and it was shocking then. But now it's happening over and over and over. So far this year, we've had 17 of, of these mass shootings, mass killings. 
The year before we had 27. The year before that we had 30. But if you look at the trajectory, well, that, and that's, you're, you're using a different because some people say any a mass shooting amounts to, to three or more people being shot, which m makes many, many more than than what you just Absolutely. described. Absolutely, I'm, you're I'm talking using about the FBI statistics of what they qu qualify as a mass in shooting, a big which public is a lot place. of people, a yeah. lo lo <laughs> lot of folks. However, the incidences of gun violence are only increasing. So we have to acknowledge the fact for all of us that something needs to be taking place and we can't just ignore it because it's not going to go away on its own. We seem to be, Brian, um, at, at a place though, as I, I said off the top of the program, that because we can't seem to come up with something that we think would solve everything, then we don't do anything. <laughs> exactly. We know many things we need to do. There is just not the will. And, and what are those things? Well, the words gun control are anathema to many people, but we need more gun control. We need several things. You shouldn't be able to buy an automatic conversion kit, that is to turn a firearm into an automatic firearm. You shouldn't have the This huge, is beyond the bump stocks, right? Yeah. Because those are have been outlawed. Yeah. You should not have readily available silencers. Hmm. You should not have assault weapons. We know all these things. You should have we should have a waiting period between trying to buy a gun, applying for it, and having a background check. There should be universal background checks. We can't even get consensus on that. No, we can't. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. When you, when, you, when you really look at it, those of us in law enforcement have been uh, advocating for a long time about the ban on assault weapons. I mean, if, if you look at these mass killings, the one thing that is in common is the type of weapon really that was used. You can't go in and kill 20, 30, 40, 50 people without something that has uh, the capacity to be automatic in a large magazine capacity. If we all know that, that's the common denominator with all this. We support, I support, those in law enforcement support the Second Amendment, but there should be limits on what you can and cannot it, it, it's own. It's interesting a because I, I, I think there's general agreement that I shouldn't be allowed to buy a bazooka. Correct. Or an anti-aircraft weapon. Um, so everybody's agreeing, I guess, by saying that, that there is a line. We're just arguing over where the line is, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, okay, that probably I mean, is I don't think you accurate. want, you, you don't want to outlaw handguns, No, do you? absolutely not. Or rifles? No, not at yeah. all. Yeah. But anything that would be defined as a weapon of war, yeah. something that our, our military uses to go into a combat zone where its sole design is to kill people, no one hunts with an AK-47. You know, no one's hunting with a lot of these AR-15s. These are, these are weapons of mass destruction, and I think that... Uh, you know, we have to recognize what they're used for and, and, and restrict who gets to own those kinds of weapons. You know, I don't think that's necessarily the, the total solution for us. Not that, totally. Right, because... But you, that's what... Can, is, is it a solution? Because that's well, what I'm back to, it. something I, versus I don't, anything. I don't know that it is, because you can make any laws about, you know, restricting any types of weapons. If you're a criminal and you want to get a gun, you're going to get a gun. What, what we need more is more awareness in the community. There have been so many warning signs of these shooters that people have been told ahead of time. I, that person told me that they wanted to kill somebody. That person told me that they wanted to commit acts of violence. Well, if you have that knowledge, it's incumbent upon you to come to law enforcement and explain that so that we can all work together and take steps. Is there a reason not to have a red flag law like that then? Well, the policymakers can make whatever laws that they want. Whether you have a red flag law or not, it's still incumbent upon citizens to take their own affirmative steps and call local law enforcement and say, I have a suspicion that this person told me that they want to kill somebody. You should look into that. A anybody can do that, whether you have a law on the books or not. Brian, go ahead. It, it, well, interesting, I want to point out, you know, being where you are and being around U of M, a lot of the incubator sort of thinking on some of these people, uh, on many of these mass shooters, seems to happen at the age of, say, people who are in college or so. So you're, uh, inter I'm, I'm interested yes. in your uh, awareness of this. What Matt said is true about people should contact law enforcement as the mother of the murderer yes. in the last uh, one in Texas. In El Paso did, did. That, yes, um, yeah. There wasn't much that could be done. Yeah, yeah. And I, I disagree on criminals will still get guns. It, true, criminals are criminals, 
But some of these shooters are not criminals. Certainly not much. They have of a not record. been criminals until they start at the very top of crime. What would Benny? It, what would what would a um, a solid sort of approach to this sort of citizenry? Uh, everybody looking out for their neighbor. How, how do we how do we make that it's work? It's almost like to see something, say something. Uh, it know, is that. Yeah. That's exactly right. So, do we have the bandwidth and the manpower though to chase down everybody that that uh, you get a call about? Those of us in law enforcement don't. There's no way we could monitor in law enforcement all the traffic that goes. But somebody is monitoring what other people are saying, you know, somebody who has 50, 60,000 people on Instagram or whatever and they're uh, following folks and they see something that should raise a flag, then that's when they're incumbent. So we would have to, as we in law enforcement quite often do, have to rely upon the citizens to inform us when they see something that is not, uh, that, that we may not be aware of, just like what happened with the young man in El Paso. Somebody said something, but what we did with it is a question. Was it proper? I don't know. I think as we dig in further, we'll figure it out. And the reason why that is so important is this conversation goes well beyond firearms. If you look at what happened in France, somebody used a truck to drive through a crowd. In Ohio, somebody attacked people with a knife. They've done that in London. Uh, people who are homegrown violent extremists are using other weapons, not just firearms. They are targeting mass venues to inflict a mass amount of damage. And if we have some reporting about that, if, we, if law enforcement at least has the tools, if they have more information from the public, then we have a better ability to step in. What is it? Oh, you can, we can point to some other places, but there is something uniquely American about our problem. What is it? What's going on? The rest of the world has violent video games. The rest of the world has internet and broadband access. The rest of the world does not have access to guns the way that we do in the U.S., although there are plenty of guns in Canada, for example, per capita, but nothing approaching the U.S. appetite for guns. What is it that's uniquely American about what's happening? Well, the examples that I just used didn't even, some of them didn't take place in America. I mean, you have New Zealand, you, can, yes. you have London, you have uh, uh, France. But so, we're kind of, but, but we're, we're the NFL. When, I mean, you're talking about the minor leagues. We're the NFL when it comes to mass killings. Uh, we're the Super Bowl in the NFL. Uh, yes, yes, I'm afraid yes. so. Aren't we? I mean, is there something American about this that... I, I think what we were talking about prior to us going on the air is that we, we, we seem to have a very big tolerance for these types of activities because they keep happening. We have this discussion like we're having now. And again, a few weeks later, it'll be like... Back to what Brian like it, said. Like it, or, yeah, just like Brian said, it, it'll be like... The shock value is, is wearing off. Well, talk about the shock value weighing off. About 45 people are murdered in this country every day. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. is that a story anymore? I mean, 45... If a foreign country invaded this country and inflicted the damage on us that, that, we, that we do to one another, on we'd go to war over that, That's and we good. have. All right. Thanks for the conversation, man. Right. we got to get to a break. Thank you very much for being here. We come back. Well, what a bit we do about the rising waters all around us in Michigan. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.